Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. What's one of the hardest parts about staffing a small nonprofit? Turnover. It's a frustrating thing small nonprofits have to deal with. Today, Jason Vienna and I dig into this executive director's dilemma. Stay tuned. Hi, Jason. Hi, Jess. Thanks for being on the podcast again. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. It's so much fun. Uh, you are like my favesies now, so I have to have you back on some sort of regular basis because it's it's too fun to have you here. It's fun to see what the questions are and to be able to uh, to give really thoughtful answers that have no consequences on my life. So, <laughs> Yes, that is that is a joy, right? Absolutely. Totally. All right. So speaking of questions, I have a doozy for you today. And um, if you're ready to get started, I will just launch into it. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Questioner says, I'm the executive director of a small animal rescue, and we have a handful of full-time employees and a bunch of part-timers. I always feel like I'm finding great qualified people to hire, but there's a problem. No one seems to stay for the long term. I'm the only employee that's been with the rescue for longer than two years, and the constant turnover is making it impossible for us to grow. We have a small budget, and I know we can't afford to pay what folks could get in the for-profit sector or even at other large nonprofits. So how can I get good employees to stick around? Wow. If you're going to pick one question, Jess, why don't you pick an easy one? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot to that question. I mean, it's, man, there's so many pieces to that. I mean, where, where do you want to start? I mean. Well, I, I definitely see a few legs here. And I think, you know, the first one is is hiring, right? They think they're hiring great people. And I know, you know, you as an executive director have to go through this. So is that common for you? I mean, do you feel like, yes, I'm hiring this, these great people and then they just keep ending up being not great people? How do you, what's your filter? Well, there's so many questions. You know, I, I'm always driven by something I learned I can't remember if it was in HR class or if it was just a really wise person that said, in general, people don't leave their jobs, they leave their managers. And so my first thought, there's certainly process things that we need to address. But if if this person writing the question is the common denominator, I mean, that's certainly worth the question. But if you've got staff, if you're being transparent when you hire them and they still keep leaving, I mean, I would ask them would be my first question because it could be a culture piece. And it could be a compensation piece. I know we, you know, we're a small nonprofit. You know, I, I run an organization here in Dakota County. We have 12 staff. And we do have some turnover, but it's usually, I don't know, expected turnover, if that makes sense. Sure. People don't stay forever and you can't really expect them to stay forever. And I mean, maybe this person's, this ED's expectations are unreasonable. You know, maybe the position is generally pretty low level and people are trying to like move on in their career and they should reset their expectations too. I mean, I think there's three things here. There's the hiring. There's who, who are you selecting and how is your selection process? Then there's retaining employees. Yeah. Why aren't you keeping these great employees if they really are great? And then the third thing is of course like the money, the budget, right? So That's, you know, the the person that writes the question they said they don't have a hard time getting good staff. They have a hard time keeping them. So I think retention seems to be the key piece of this. Because if you're finding really good people and you can't keep them, there's got to be a reason for that. And that's either culture or compensation. That's how it boils down in my mind. And so it, there's there's two paths to go down. Which one do you want to address first, culture or compensation? Right. Culture. Culture. Yeah. If you've got good people, you obviously have a mission that people are going to appeal to. If you're, if you're working in the nonprofit sector, you know, and it's, I, I read the part of the question where she says, you know, you don't make as much as you make in the for-profit sector, but that isn't necessarily the case. The for-profit sector is a very large comparison, and there's lots of parts of the for-profit sector. You could actually make more money in the nonprofit sector 
than in a lot of parts in the for-profit sector. So that's a that's kind of a short-sighted comparison. But if you're getting people in, they're they're drawn to your mission. She runs uh, an animal rescue. That's obviously a very appealing mission that is a very emotional for folks. Uh, back to the hiring piece, really vetting out if people have thought through whether or not their mission matches their life, I guess. You know, there, there could be a compensation piece getting people, but if people are coming in and they're leaving, this makes me wonder why. I, I want to talk to the staff. I, I'm with this too. I mean, I think there is, you know, obviously the retention piece is key, but, and we're just going to assume this ED is, is a woman. So she says, I feel like I'm finding great qualified people. Well, based on what? I, I mean, in my experience with animal rescues, passion for the animals is sort of the key thing. And so if people are demonstrating, I love dogs and your dog rescue, or I love this breed of dog and you're a very specific type of rescue. That is important. And you want to hire people who are passionate about your mission, obviously, but that's like not the only thing that makes somebody good at their job. And in fact, if you're only hiring people who are just like super passionate about advocating for the animal, they may suck at other parts of the job that you're hiring them for. And I, I've definitely seen that in animal rescue groups that I have worked with. There, there can be a lot of uh, inner drama and inner turmoil because people get so fired up about the animals and the fact that the animal has no voice. And so they become the voice of the animals, so they think. And so there could be a hiring component here. Well, there could also be a leadership blind spot. I mean, that that same passion that drives people to want to be involved in the mission and love animals also could blind the ED. We, you know, we're all human. We all have things we don't see. Maybe that's the thing the ED is looking for most in their hiring. And do they have someone else involved in that process? You know, I, I my strategy in general as a leader is to make sure that I've got people around me that see things differently. And so I'm very curious in the process, do they have you know, said they have a small budget, do they have an HR consultant or do they have a board member who specializes in hiring or even another key staff member that sits in that's looking for a different thing? Like I, I know my, my blind side is, is marketing and communicating. If you are a good communicator, I am going to be, uh, very excited to have you. But I also invite in other staff members to, that look for different things. And so maybe in the process, they can make sure they have the right set of people assessing. Because if the ED is super stoked because, man, they love animals and, oh, they worked in this field somewhere, the other person in the interview can say, yeah, but, you know, they've done nothing with volunteers and they've never worked in an organization of this size. So maybe as you build your hiring process, making sure you've got the right perspectives involved. Yeah. You know, I love the thing you said about people don't leave their job, they leave their manager. You know, it's hard to hear this advice when it comes, but it's like, if you're the common denominator <laughs> with all of your employees leaving and you are the only supervisor, because this is a small nonprofit and you're the boss of everybody, you need, you do probably need to look in the mirror. Sorry. Well, no, and you shouldn't be sorry. And you, if you're going to lead, if you're going to put yourself in the position and raise your hand and say, I'm going to lead this organization. I'm going to take on all that that means. And that's a big thing. I mean, it's intimidating even, and I've been in this for over four years. You got to be open to that. You have to be able to look at yourself critically and take feedback because you're not going to do everything perfectly. And for some reason, whether it's in the choosing, whether it's in the retention, whether it's in the culture, this leader doesn't have this process right. And so they need to make sure around them someone's given them the feedback they need. Maybe they need to bring someone in to do a you know a deeper dive exit survey with these staff to figure out what it is. Because I mean you know the, the other point we haven't talked about is the compensation and the budget piece. You know, that can certainly be addressed, and whether that's through creative staffing models or being more transparent on the front end. But if you don't have the right process in place for retention and for selection. I don't know that the compensation really matters as much. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people sign up for nonprofit jobs full well knowing that it does not pay better than other jobs they could have. So when we sign up for this work, we know, you know, even in, I'm not a nonprofit, 
But being a lawyer for nonprofits means I'm not, you know, rolling in buckets of cash because I'm not in a super, super lucrative practice area. And I know that going in. So, you know, your employees are coming in because they think this work is important. And so making the culture around being there one that is healthy and supportive and not just totally taking advantage of everybody um, for their passion. Well, is super to key. turn this around on you, Jess, I mean, you know, working with nonprofit clients, you know what your compensation is going to be. You know, it's going to be a little different than if you were in the for-profit sector, but you've worked with clients that you've really enjoyed that felt used your talents well. And you've worked with clients, I'm certain that don't, What's the telltale for you? Like, what what is it? No, taking the compensation out of it, what kind of clients do you like to work with versus which ones do you not? Right. And you can build that into your hiring, you know? Absolutely. So the budget thing. This is another piece where it's like, well, we have a really small budget. Well, if you're the executive director and you think that you need to compensate people more fairly, more closer to market rates, which is important right? That's on you to a certain extent. Is it not, Mr. Executive Director? <laughs> it's, it's completely on you. And I think people think of this question often in, in just one lens. And I think there's two. There's, we have so much work to do. We just can't pay everyone that needs to get done. Well, you have to try to fundraise and raise more money. And if for some reason you can't fundraise enough to pay all the staff to run all the programs that you need, you got to make a tough decision to say, we can't do everything. You know, it's not fair to put staff in a position to say, look, we can't afford any more staff, but we got more work to do. Yeah, That's we're going to still, we're still going to help 10,000 animals a year, even though we only have enough budget to appropriately rescue 500. And that's the challenging part of leadership. You have to say yes to one thing and no to another. I don't have enough to pay 10 staff. So we're only going to do eight staff worth of work. And then I'm going to take that out to the donors and to our foundation partners and say, here's all the things we can't do. Please help us get there. But you've got to put the staff that you have in a position where they can be successful in their work. Because again, regardless of compensation, regardless of your love for your mission, people take positions in nonprofits because they want to feel like they're doing important work. And it's so easy to allow staff or volunteers to take on so much they can't possibly succeed. And at the end of the day, no matter how important your work is, if you go home every day feeling bad, feeling like you couldn't get it all done, feeling like you let people or animals down, eventually you're going to walk away because that's just not sustainable. Yeah, because you take what they were passionate about and you turn it into trauma. No matter how great the boss is, at some point, you're so dejected that you just have to go somewhere else. You do because you have to be protected from yourself in some ways. And that's, that's what a good boss is supposed to do. You know, I think about in our organization, just since the pandemic has hit the number of, you know, we've scaled up to two to three times our normal size, which is remarkable. Now we've added staff and we've added space. We've added all kinds of things. And there is still, like we were serving 7,000 people a month. Now we're serving between fifteen and 20,000 people a month. That's remarkable. But you know what? We're still not hitting all the parts of our community that need help. But I have to stop my staff and say, what we're doing is what we can do. And we can't do anymore. And that's okay. You have to find a way to feel good about what you do, knowing any, whether it's animal rescue or running a food shelter or running a domestic violence shelter. The work will never be done and you have to find a way find a way to be okay with it and to make sure that your staff know it's okay to take care of themselves and to stop. Key part of retention. That is fabulous advice. So just to kind of sum up, for hiring, I think the lesson here is real you know, really define the qualifications, not just based on passion on the mission. And, you know, it's okay to trust that passion for the mission will follow because your mission is good. You know, you don't have to only hire people that are obsessed. <laughs> um, for retention, examining your own management style and then consciously cultivating a positive culture. I think that's one that 
a lot of executive, new executive directors at small organizations overlook, especially because we're just in the swamp of doing, 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 doing. And it's hard to lift up out of that and look at what am I creating here? And then budget, what I heard you say basically is like lack of resources isn't an excuse to overwork your staff. It's an opportunity to engage in meaningful fundraising because now you've reached the limit of what you can accomplish um, given the funds you have. I think you put that perfectly. That's yeah. With, without without us inviting this this questioner onto the podcast, I mean that's the best way. If you're if you're listening to this and this is something you're seeing in your organization, I think these are really good starting points for how you can assess it. I mean, it's just you just laid it out perfectly. Good job, Jess. <laughs> it's it's almost like people should come to you for counsel or something. Oh, it's like you're, stop. you're wise. Funny. Shameless plugs for Birkin Law by Jason Vienna. Um, thanks so much for being here, Jason. Promise me you'll come back again. Anytime, Jess. I, I love spending time with you and I love answering these questions because it's I, it's just it's fun and I, I hope it's helpful for those listening. I hope so too. And I think your wisdom as an ED is, is so great to share with everyone. So thank you very much. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.